I grew up in the willy wags of Williamsport, Maryland. And literally, I, I lived on the very last house in the middle of nowhere. And being raised in the country, what that meant for me as a kid was my school bus ride was gonna be extra long. And every morning, my ride to school was about at least 45 minutes to an hour long, and that's every morning and every afternoon. So if you've got a long bus ride like that, uh, maybe you know you, you end up spending a whole lot of time in your imagination, and you spend a whole lot of time thinking, and I have a whole lot of school bus memories. And one of those memories was of a little boy my age who rode my school bus, we'll just call him Joe. And Joe was a simple, normal little boy with a shy personality, and he lived in a blue house on the other river bend that was not my river bend. <laughs> and when, I, when the bus came around to little Joe's blue house, the bus would stop and Joe would get in. And when Joe walked past me every morning, I would get this whiff. And I would think, mm. <laughs> and I would turn my head. And as a kid, I didn't recognize that scent. I didn't know what that was, but I decided pretty quick I didn't like it. And so week after week, day after day, morning after morning, Jeff would get on the bus. Uh, Joe would get on the bus. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. At me. Okay, he would get on the bus and he would walk past me and, and I would turn my head because I just, I wasn't into that scent. I don't know what was in his house or what that scent was, but I, I just wasn't a fan and, and that was my story and my memory of Joe. Well, fast forward decades later to just recently at my home, I was upstairs in my bathroom when I reached for a, a bath towel, and when I pulled that bath towel up to my face, I got this whiff of something that literally flashed me back four decades to my past, to that school bus, and I remembered that scent, and I identified that scent because now I'm an adult and I know what that scent was. As a kid, I had no idea what that scent was, but that scent reminded me of Joe. <laughs> As an adult, I knew what it was. I knew exactly what that was. The scent was bleach. Now, I know now as an adult that people clean their homes with bleach. They use it to sanitize. They put it in their laundry. I put it in my laundry now. I put it in my towels to clean germs and to freshen my towels up when I wash them. And now suddenly, after all these years, after all that time, my mind goes back and I think, wow. All that time I thought, Joe lived in a dirty home. Turns out Joe was cleaner than I was. <laughs> Hi, my name's Pastor Beth and I'm a recovering Pharisee. Oh, it didn't take me long as a kid to learn how to be a finger pointing, Bible stomping, hell raising, po finger pointing, judgmental condemnation what happened to my computer right now. It didn't take me long to learn how to point fingers. It didn't take me long to learn how to make assumptions, form opinions, and condemn someone up here in my head. It didn't take me long at all. In fact, I remember, I remember talking to my friends in school and, and saying things like, oh, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're going to hell. I remember telling my friends, my high school friends, well, you don't go to the right church because your church doesn't worship like my church does. I remember the look on certain friends' faces when I told them if they weren't ready for the rapture, they were gonna burn for eternity. Yet back then we called it witnessing. I remember the looks on their faces. I remember scaring them breathless 
because I thought I was doing the right thing. I remember telling my peers. I remember scaring my peers. Oh, I could point faults left and right and point out accusations and call out condemnations with the best of them. I could do that. As a young adult, I remember standing in a picket line. Now, for those of you who don't have any idea what a picket line is, how many have stood in a picket line? Not very many of us. <laughs> okay, so for the youngins, a picket line is kind of like a social media post, except you put it on a big sign and you have to leave your house and you have to go stand in front of the person you don't like and hold it up. <laughs> right? It, it's pretty much the same thing. We could just, now we can just pick it from the safety and comfort of our own living rooms. I remember standing in the picket line and, and I was biblically standing for the right thing. But I don't remember taking the time to stop and consider the shame I might have been causing for the person doing the wrong thing. I've been there. I've been that judgmental condemning, pointing finger person. And I'll be transparent. It's just, it's interesting to me how quickly we become judge and jury without realizing the damage that we're doing. I'll be transparent for a, just a second, but the most shocking thing these last couple of years that we've all endured together was not the virus and the horrible toll that it played on our world, it was not the isolation and how that changed us, it was not the division and the social divisions and the political visions. What absolutely shocked me the most is how Christ following, praise and worship singing, well-meaning, God-fearing, Jesus-loving folks can love each other one day and hate each other the next. Shocking. A couple weeks ago, I woke up and I noticed on Facebook a pastor friend of mine who doesn't live around here, somewhere in one of the Carolinas, I noticed the post. It said, that's it. I will never, ever respect Will Smith again. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And suddenly, in one moment, people went from being fans to foes. People went from being admirers to condemners because of an accident, not an accident, I'm sorry, a mistake, right? Yeah. It's getting awkward in here. <laughs> this is not my favorite kind of message. <laughs> But it, it, it blows my mind when someone we love makes a mistake, falls down, and suddenly all the fingers, all the stones, all the pickets, all the posts. And it, not just that, not just the automatic condemnation, but the automatic divide. Because suddenly we had to choose sides, right? And that humanity works. Suddenly you choose a side and you choose it boldly and you choose it loudly and you choose it with, con with conviction and you decide, who do I hate in this moment? Do I hate the man who made a joke or do I hate the man who approached the stage and lost his cool? Who do I hate right now? Who do I throw the stone at? Jesus, help us. Help us. Because it's easy to take a side. It's so easy to take a side, but especially when you don't know the whole story. Especially when you don't know everything that happened behind the scenes. When you don't know everything one was feeling and what the other one really intended to do. You just don't know. I say, Jesus, help us. Lord, help us. Matthew chapter 7 said, For you will be treated as you treat others. 
The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye right now when you have a log in your own? And how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get that speck out of your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye right now? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Can you turn to your neighbor right now? Look him in the face. Look him in the face. Say, you got something in your eye. <laughs> you got something in your eye. Can't find my straw. The truth is, friends, we all have something in our eye. Every single one of us, <clears throat> every single one of us has something in our eye at all times, every day, right? And when you think of it that way, if the Bible is saying, listen, once you get that speck out of your eye, then you can go ahead and help the person with their speck. It gives you something to think about. It gives you a pause before you start reaching. It gives you a pause before you start pointing. It gives you a pause before you start condemning, correct? All of us at one point or another can be just a little bit blinded by a log. In John chapter eight, there was a woman who was caught in a sin. It said Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and he taught them. Now picture it, Jesus is in the temple and the crowd came, so he decided to teach them. It was a teaching moment. They were having church. It was a Sunday school class. I don't know how big the crowd was, but Jesus had a purpose and an intention in that moment to teach. When, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Talk about not knowing the whole story because I know for one thing, I don't really know a whole lot about this, but I'm pretty sure she couldn't have been doing that alone. Talk about the rest of the story. Like, anyway. Jesus was in the middle of teaching when the religious folks interrupted that day. You see, I, I think religion has a way of interrupting things. I think a religious critical spirit can interrupt a good thing. I think there can be sometimes in the middle of what God is doing and how God is moving, a religious spirit would love to show up and become a distraction in the middle of all that because everywhere Jesus went, he was confronted by a condemning, finger-pointing religious spirit. Condemnation makes a perfect distraction. And when Mary studied at Jesus' feet, think about it. Mary studied at Jesus' feet and the religious spirit rose up in her sister saying, why isn't she helping me in the kitchen? When the sinful woman in the Bible talks about her bringing her expensive perfume and offering it to Jesus as an offering and pouring it over his feet and washing her, his feet with her hair and her tears. The religious spirit rose up in the accountant in the room and said, why so much waste? When the children were, bringing, were coming to Jesus and being brought to Jesus by their parents, a religious spirit rose up in the disciples and said, hey, get them away from him. He's busy. He's important. See, the religious spirit keeps showing up and following Jesus everywhere he went, everywhere he tried to do something good. The religious spirit would show up and become a distraction. When Jesus spent time with shady characters and tax collectors and sinners, a religious spirit would show up in the church and say, why does he hang out with those people? <laughs> Jesus said, I'm a friend of sinners. 
When crowds praised Jesus, he wrote, when he rode into Jerusalem, the crowds and the children began to praise him. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A religious spirit rose up in the crowd and said, why are they honoring him so much? It's a perfect distraction condemnation. Let's read about it. Today's Palm Sunday. Let's look at the story. Luke chapter 19. As he rode along, the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But... Some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. You see, condemnation has no ma is no match for Jesus. Condemnation is never a match for the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus always had a quick comeback. He always had an answer. He said to Mary's accuser, leave her alone. She's choosing the right thing right now. But in this case, back at the temple, what about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery? What's his response going to be when the accused really is very guilty? John chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses said to stone her, what do you say? And they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stopped and he wrote down in the dust with his finger. Now, I love that Jesus stooped down. Because a religious spirit, a condemnation spirit, wants to hover over and point down. But our Savior stooped down. And I don't know what he was thinking, but I loved that he got down. Because when condemnation is quick, the Spirit of God is slow. I'll show you what I mean. In Psalm chapter 103, it says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we, what? Deserve. I don't have any idea why Jesus stooped down. I don't have any idea what he was writing in the sand that day, but I know this. When the accusers in the room are focused on punishment, Jesus is planning a pardon. Jesus is planning someone's pardon in this room today. Jesus is planning a pardon for someone watching online. You may feel accused, you may look accused, you may have been caught red-handed, you may be 100% guilty, but I'm here to tell you the Spirit of Christ does not accuse you today. He's planning your pardon. He's planning your pardon. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught. She was caught. We have proof. We saw it. We caught her red-handed. She's exposed. The law of Moses said to stone her. What do you say? Jesus kept stirring his finger in the sand. But finally, verse 7, they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and he said, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. You know the story. One by one. As Jesus stooped down again and wrote in the dust, when the accusers heard him say this, they slipped away one by one. Beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. 
And then Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers now? Some of you have been through a lot. Some of you have fallen and rose again. Some of you have made mistakes and picked yourself up again. Some of you have walked difficult journeys, but you're here, but you're here today. You're following God, you're in the right place, you're surrounded by sons and daughters, family of God, sisters and brothers. And I would say to you, where are your accusers now? Where are your accusers now? Where are my accusers now? Jesus said, you're totally worthy to throw a stone right now if you've never sinned. One by one, as logic and reason begin to kick in in that moment. One by one, oldest to youngest, the accusers, they left the building. <laughs> Somebody say, the accusers have left the building. And then he stood up again and he said to this woman, where are your accusers now? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, for all the truthies in the room, yes, there is a standard. Yes, the word of God is true and infallible. Yes, there is a thing called sin that keeps us out of relationship with Christ. Yes, there is a thing called sin that Christ came and bled and died for and covered that so that we would find a way of redemption, right? Yes, there are laws. I don't want anybody breaking the law right now. And those of you who are afraid that because Will Smith jumped on a stage and punched somebody that now everybody has a right to do that, please don't get any ideas. I, I know there's this thing, there's this truth and there's this grace and there's this tension between truth and grace and what's right and what's wrong and what's black and what's white. And I know that God is a God who separates sheep from goats. And I know this, I know that the justice of God is a very real thing, but God is kind. And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance this morning. And I just happen to believe that grace comes first. And the reason why I believe that grace comes first is because Jesus said what he said. He did what he did. And then he said, I'm not going to condemn you right now. But here's a plan for your redemption. Go. Change your ways. Stop doing what you're doing. Make effort to improve. Go and sin no more. See, it was grace and truth. John chapter one tells us that Jesus walked in the fullness of grace and truth. And I know some of us in the room lean more towards truthy, and some of us in the room lean more toward gracey, and we're never gonna be like Jesus. And we're never gonna walk in the fullness of truth and grace. But we can learn from this story, first of all, there's always more to the story than what meets the eye. Remember the other half of that adultery? We can learn to be slow to condemn and, and slow to get angry. We can also learn that stone you got in your hand right now, maybe it's time to put it down. Maybe it's time to put it down. The grace and the truth of Jesus didn't let her off the hook that day. It didn't let her off the hook. He didn't condemn her either, but he led her gracefully into the right way. He led her into truth. Grace came first and he said, go and sin no more. There's a way, there's a path. There's a path of righteousness. There's a plan for redemption. There's a plan for restoration. But if we're not the authority in the room, how about 
We let the authority in the room take care of it. How about we put the stone down and put the people in the hands of God? This past week, I, on the way to school, I, have, I, won't, I won't tell you who, but there's a sixth grader who lives in my house. <laughs> and over the course of this year, it's been, it's been a wild year. And um, <laughs> he's rambunctious, and he's a normal six-year-old boy. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's a sixth grade boy. Joe, Jeff. <laughs> anyway, he was on the way to school because and we were talking about the fact that he had an after school detention. You see, in school, if you accumulate lunch detentions and you get to a certain number, it becomes hardcore after school detention. Now, a couple of these detentions, I will admit I'm his mom and I will say he didn't deserve those detentions, but some he did. He truly did. He truly did. And so on the way to school, I could, feel, I could feel the tension and I could feel like he was anticipating this impending doom of staying after school for two hours. I could feel it. I could feel it. You know, I could have lectured him all the way to school. I could have told him why he's dis uh, distracting to his teachers. I could tell him that he, he's loud and he needs to close his mouth sometimes. I could tell him to keep his mask up above his nose. I could, tell, I could lecture him on all the ways to stay out of trouble. But I didn't have to because I could feel in the car that he was already carrying the shame. So instead, I took him by the hand and I prayed for him all the way to school. I thank God for the plans that he has for my boy. I thank God that he sees into his future and not just in his today. I thank God that his plans for him are good and that the calling on his life is so much bigger than his mistakes. I held his hand and I said, Lord, would you lead him and guide him into truth? Would you give him wisdom to make good choices? Holy Spirit, would you fill him and give him discernment so that he would make the right decisions as he goes through his day at school? And Lord, at the end of the day, may he know without a shadow of a doubt that you don't condemn him, but you love him with an everlasting love. I still believe with all my heart it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. I believe with all my heart grace comes first. We can lecture, we can point, we can pick it. But grace has to come first. We all need the grace of God. We've all got specks in our eyes and logs in our eyes and get Joe's and Jeff's wrong and we don't even know how old our kids are. <laughs> Grace comes first. One question I have for all the sports fans as the worship team prepares to come up. I used to watch football with my, bro well, no, I used to watch my brothers watch football growing up. Honestly, I didn't enjoy watching the sport, but I enjoyed being in the room with my brothers when they would cheer and sneer and jeer, and when they would jump up, when they would shout, when they would celebrate, and when they would feel the defeat of the loss. And I, I just loved being in the room. I loved the squeals and the screaming and the Victory of all, I loved all of it, the noise of it, kind of like Mario. <laughs> but one thing about football that I never understood growing up and still don't, honestly, you know that part where the guy who's running with the ball and then the other guy in the other color will come up and tackle him down and lay on top of him, right? And then all of a sudden, everybody else comes and jumps on too? Like, that's the part I never got. Like, he's down. But then 
Tom, Dick, Harry, Joe, Stanley, they all come running on and get on top as well, right? I never understood that part. Because if the man is down, why do we all feel the need to jump on top of the pile? Why is that? Maybe because the ball came loose. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Fair enough, George. Because I wondered if it was because we enjoyed being on the top of the pile, not on the bottom of the pile. I wondered if some would jump and jump and pile up on the pile because they remember what it felt like when they were at the bottom of the pile. I wonder if some people run and jump on top of the pile just to prove to their team whose side they're on. Or I wonder if we're just afraid that whoever's on the bottom of that pile just might get up again. My Bible says that when a righteous man or woman falls, even if they fall seven times, they're going to get up again. A righteous person gets up again. And what kind of person was it that fell? Righteous. Righteous people fall and righteous people get up. Just Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back up onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into that same temptation yourself because you got that log in your eye. The Bible says we who are spiritual should gently restore someone who's at the bottom of the pile. Not pile up on top. Restore them out from underneath the pile. Proverbs 24, 16 says don't wait in ambush at the home of the godly. I, I consider this a warning. And don't raid the house where the godly live. The Bible says don't even bother trying and here's why. The godly may trip seven times but they will get up again. And we need a reminder this morning that when the accusers want to condemn, God still wants to restore. Yes. Psalm 23, I can't get away from it all year long. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And then what happens? He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Do you see that? For his name's sake. He picks me up. He takes me to a lush, refreshing, restorative place. He makes me lie down brings me to a place of healing and he restores my soul in that place. He doesn't leave me there because the next thing on his plan is to pick me up from that place and lead me on a path of righteousness for his name's sake. But did you see what happened? Grace came first. Grace comes first. Maybe you're here today and you've been that Pharisee. You've been like me. You've just have it in you to, to want what's right. And, and that's okay. That, that's a godly character in your nature for there to be truth and for there to be justice and for there to be rules and laws and guardrails that keep everybody safe and in the right place and in the right frame of mind. That is a godly characteristic today. But even God knows, on this side of heaven, we're not always going to get it right. Not on this side of heaven. But there's still hope for the Pharisees. Because I'm one of them. And my prayer, even today, is Lord, remove any condemnation from inside of my heart. Remove any condemnation. 
Remove a spirit of religion in me that wants to point out what other people are doing wrong when I've got a log in my eye. Lord, would you clean me? Would you, would you clean me from that desire? Would you take away that desire? That, would you give me freedom from condemnation today? The Word says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or maybe you're here today and you, you feel like that woman who was caught. And yes, you did something wrong and you made the mistake and wasn't even a secret. You, you did it in front of a lot of people and the whole world saw. And now, now you feel exposed and you feel like, I can't even live this life. How am I supposed to face my friends? How am I supposed to face my family? How am I supposed to face God? Can I encourage you today? Your accusers aren't here. your accusers now they're not here and neither does Jesus condemn you pick yourself up righteous man pick yourself up righteous woman and get back up again